Good evening everybody and welcome to tonight's On The Sofa. We've really spoiled you this week too, in four days. Um, Mark has filled off on Monday and another legend tonight, uh, Jamie Russell, Academy Director. So we will bring Vic on and we'll get straight on with it. Chris, a very good evening to you. Evening, I hope Vic. you're well on this beautifully sunny evening. It's a magnificent spell of weather we're having at the moment. Summer's arrived, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. It has. Yeah. Well, I've just had to close the window because it's barbecues all around here and it's making me feel really hungry. So <laughs> yeah, close the window. Time of the year. <laughs> Definitely. If I might say, um, um, two two weeks tonight is. at this yes. very two weeks tonight at this very moment, uh, we will be launching the STFC Museum, the Swindon Town Football Club Museum. Now we have limited spaces available. If you are interested in finding out more about it or indeed being a volunteer for the museum, etc., then there are limited spaces available for the attendance of the uh, launch uh, two weeks tonight, on the 15th of June. If you'd like to email secretary at stfcmuseum.org, that's secretary at stfcmuseum.org. Limited spaces available, but if you are interested in finding more about the museum and indeed possibly volunteering, that email address again, secretary at stfcmuseum.org. And I might give you it again a little bit later on just to plug it even more. Is that all right, Chris? I'll stick it, uh, I'll stick it on the ticker along the bottom. So brilliant. Thank when you. we get started so that people can, if they've got a pen, they can do that. Lovely. Okay, Thanks, so let's bring Jamie on. Evening. How are you? All right, Evening, how are Jamie. You? I'm good. Enjoying the sun. Yeah, Good. definitely. Yeah, yeah, too great. Okay, I'm going to leave you to it. Any questions, please put them in the comments. Again, as I say every time, we'll get through as many as we can. Okay, see you later. Thanks, Chris, very much indeed. Jamie, thank you very much indeed for giving up an hour of your valuable time. Are you on holiday at the minute or are you still at work? What, what is it? What's happening? Uh, I think that I think the term is working from home at the moment because you you never really switch off. Um, so with the boys not being in the building, um, yeah, there's loads of Zoom calls and catch up, FaceTime meetings and different things like that. So yeah, it's good for it's good for staff to have a little bit of time away from it, but we still have catch ups probably, especially me, myself and Alex at the moment. It seems to be like every other hour at the moment, but yeah, it's um, no, it's good. Uh, and what is the process at the minute? Are you looking for, for academy? Um, are they students? I'm, I'm not sure what the term is, but are you looking for, for next year or continuing the work of the, the people that are already where, there? How does it work? In terms of the players or staff? Yeah, right now. Well, the, 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 the people that you might enrol next year, as it were, in terms of players. So, we'll, yeah, so we, so that process, um, December of, of the previous season. So, we have to basically commit to our under-16 scholars. Mm -hmm. So we it, it's tough, really, because when you come back, you have pre-season, mm -hmm. you have a couple of months of the season, and then you've got to make decisions on scholars for that following year in December because you have to let them know and they have to know whether their registration is being turned into a scholarship for two years with yourself mm -hmm. or if they're going to be released. And, and that that whole part is is really difficult and puts a lot of stress on staff. Um, but I, I, I do believe, I think we've done it really well this year. It's it's not easy giving bad news, um, and it's not something you enjoy doing. Um, but there's a lot of thought and there's a lot of reasoning behind everything we do. So we're, we're very big on depth charts. So looking at the group below, so like who would be the current under fifteens. So is, if we give a scholarship to someone, are we blocking someone's pathway? And that and that's what we're all about now, right the way from, from under eights, right the way through to first team players. So Anton, who's just got a professional contract, we'll already be looking at right who's underneath him now. And it, are we are we blocking anyone? So if that's a potential block, then we need to get Anton out on loan for the season to get him great experience ready for his second year where he should hopefully then be touching around the first team but then with, with him out it allows then someone to take his place so everything is like a conveyor belt and we've got it i think i feel we've got it in a real good place at the moment and, and really well stocked 
So we, we break it down in goalkeepers, right backs, centre backs, left sided centre backs, midfielders. So we break down what we have. So whether it's a four, eight, and a ten, we have position profiles for each one of those. So we have a four A and a four B. So a four A is like a Louis Reed, someone who's going to get on the ball and get you playing, mm. and a four B is a oh, it's not really a word, but a breaker upper. So like a Khan who will mm-hmm. go and win the ball for you, give it to someone, and then we can go and play. But we have to be really mindful of of what managers play and styles of football because within a period of us getting a boy through from nine right the way through to 18, it's a 12-year cycle. It's, it's, it's a huge cycle. And within that cycle, we could have 10 different managers. The game could have changed four or five different ways so everyone might go from a 3-5-2 to a 4-3-3 to a 4-4-2 so we have to try and produce players that can fit and adapt to any cycle that comes around really we're we're not in a position within an academy to say we want one of those we have to make sure that all of our players are very very comfortable at at least two positions Um, you you talked about the difficult decisions we talked before about how that's changed in as much that players aren't just dumped anymore. There is a great deal of care and afterthought to when those decisions are made. And that's been a, a big development in recent times. I know there are some high profile Premier League players who've talked about this and how difficult it has been when, when young players are released. But I know there's a great deal of thought goes into that now, isn't there? Yeah. we're. I've worked at clubs previously where, where you have retain and release. And it's kind of like that dreaded thing and... For us, we want the county ground to be something where boys look forward to coming to. Not a case of, oh, it's the green mile. And it's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm coming, am I, am I going to be kept on or am I getting released? We've been very, very clear all the way through the season this year, through their reviews, we've rag rated them red, amber, green. So there's no shocks and no surprises. And then if, if there has been a release, if as a group of staff, we've decided that it's a release decision, then the parent is contacted as to say, look, how do you want to do this? You know your son better than us. It's wrong for us to bring your son in, give him bad news, and then kind of expect him to get on with his dad. Mm-hmm. So we say, look, you can break it to them, and then they can come in and get feedback, and we'll and then we'll continue with the player care and the transition process after that. Or if you feel like it's something that he needs and he comes in and gets the decision, that then we can do it that way. But I feel it's like Sean, Sean Woods, Alex Pike, you know, it, they're horrible phone calls and, and it's something that, you know, we discuss and it's something that they have to build themselves up to. It's not just, oh yeah, I'll pick up the phone and give the bad news. It's it's not like that at all. And and I think sometimes people just think that there's no thought or there's no emotion or feeling attached to it. Um, I just think you get better at coping with it and dealing with it rather than enjoying it because you know but once once the news has been given then that player care part will kick in then for the next three years so we've we've got um sophie morrow has just joined us from cambridge united so we lost ben we lost ben hawkins who's done really really well with the player care program and i think before there was funding for the player care role i feel like we were actually already doing that as part of our safeguarding role and i think we've just we've just took it on to another level now um, Ben's Ben's been headhunted. He was headhunted by Formula One. Right. So they're, they're going very big with player care now. Um, and Ben presented for us because we got put forward for a player care award uh, for how we've been using our program basically. So there was us, Arsenal, um, Manchester City, Everton, and Crystal Palace, and, and we were, you know, recognised as high performing um, within this in this environment so that's that's a great accolade for us but obviously when you put staff in that shop window to go and present at premier league conferences and stuff like that formula williams team were there and they were like oh i really like the sound of what he's doing and then obviously we lose ben so we we have to understand that as much as we're gonna lose players at times we were also going to lose staff and i think that's should be looked at as a success Mm. it should be looked at as kind of you know trying to hold on to staff and not let them achieve things for their personal development. It is a huge success and a, and a massive pat on the back for us as, as to what we're doing. It gives me a headache because we're constantly, you know, it feels like times we've been just constantly transitioning in recruitment because as soon as we get a member of staff in, 
we lose them to another club. Um, and unfortunately, being a Category 3 academy, we've always got the Category 2 and the Category 1 vultures circling around us. So, you know, and if, if there's a full-time opportunity for a coach to work at a club, I, I can't stop them from that. As much as, mm-hmm. as, as you know, I'll, I'll try to, but there's, there's just nothing I, I, can, I can do to stop that. And like I okay. said, you have to look at that as a success. Well, let's talk about success then. Um, the last season, how would you sum that up? As it, uh, as it had been successful, what is success? Uh, I mean, I know we've spoken before, and you know the basic that you ask for is hard work. You know that that's yeah. the basic you ask for from anybody. What would you term as success? Is it the amount of cups you win, the amount of leagues you win? How would you sum that up? It's a great question, and it's what I. I ask the staff all the time, you know, what does success look like? I speak to, I speak to Clem, I speak to Rob and I'll ask them and go, you know, just, can you make it very clear what you want from the academy? Is it, is it to win trophies? Because this season across four competitions, we've come first in one and second in three. And, and that, that's a massive achievement mm. um, to, to win the 16s league. We, we ended up coming second in the Merit League by a point to Luton Town who are now a Premier League club. We have Bournemouth in our same league who are a Premier League club. You know, it's, it, is, it is difficult for us to compete with these clubs when they've got much bigger budgets than us. Um, but I think sometimes when you don't have the luxury of having so many staff, it makes everyone a lot tighter and, and more compact and it makes everyone work that little bit harder and also develop in many different ways. And I, and I feel that's what we've got at the moment. The Wiltshire Senior Cup, obviously we lost in the final, but I mean, we had part of the average age was 15 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if I think if the final hadn't have fell the day after the final game of the season for the first team, I think we would have had a couple of players that would just helped just in, just in key areas, just to help some of the young players through. But, you know, it was the disappointing thing about that final is we've, we've got a boy called Harley Hunt, who's, who's 15, he's not 16 until August. And I had a few arguments with, with Wiltshire FA about it because they wouldn't let him play because he was too young. Yet Harley's played in the under 18s all season. And then you see a 15 year old make his debut for Arsenal. And you see a 14 year old on the bench for Chelsea last week against Man United. And it just really annoys me that it's kind of one rule for one and not for another. And ours was a legitimate development really important play at the county ground under floodlights in front of supporters and 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 have it have it hard have it difficult but understand how important it is because as soon as harley turns 16 he could be in and around the first team during pre-season mm-hmm. but we've lost a massive chunk of his development by him not being able to play in this game and this is where it really annoys me with legislation and rules and and you know myself and and bailey coopland who's been brilliant around the academy this year you know, we, we've had, we've sent numerous letters asking for permission, um, but just to, just to get not back because I know that it's a rule. But it doesn't sit right with me that the Premier League can just, you know, you can get a boy on the pitch at fifteen in the Premier League, but you can't in the Wiltshire Cup final. Yeah, I mean, I saw Ethan Ampadu make his debut for Exeter, and he was fifteen. You know, yeah. still at still at school, so yeah. that was in a League Cup competition. So it's yeah. kind of crazy, really, isn't it, when you think yeah. about it? Yeah, so it's, how did... it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, Trevor Francis was 16 when he made his debut for Birmingham, of course, wasn't yeah. he? And, yeah. You know, you can go back and find all sorts of examples. There was the, the Wilts Shield final, of course, and then there was the Floodlit Cup final yeah. at Lincoln. Yeah. I know it's a disappointing defeat on the night. I think it was 4 1 if memory yeah. serves, but yeah. a great run to the final. Unbelievable. And like I said, you know, success is this time last year, we'd have never thought for one second we'd have got to the final of a national competition at under 17. Um, and, you know, being a little bit wiser now, we had to do a toss of a coin over, like, FaceTime like this to see who hosted the game. On the night, it made a massive difference. And I, I, I didn't, we didn't anticipate how many Lincoln fans would be there and the noise that would be generated. They put a huge drum behind our dugout. Yeah and banged it literally for 90 minutes. So none of our boys could hear anything and different things. So there were so many learning opportunities that night. And 
so many good things that we could never ever recreate in a training session or analysis session or anything like that. So yes, the result is not something that we're particularly proud of. Getting there and sampling that environment and, and the whole day of how it how it worked out was something that was really good for their development. But even though the score was four one, it, it still could have been four four or five four because we, we wasted two three really really good chances. Um, and that's and that's what the game's all about. But you know, your original question: what is success and what does success look like? So there's four situations there of real success and development. And you know, there's, there's always that battle, isn't there? Especially within academy football, winning over development. But I, but I think they actually can go hand in hand because if you develop winners or and you, and you develop people around a winning environment. I think they, they do go hand in hand. I mean, this year we've had 1,112 minutes of academy players on the first team pitch. And that's a success. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, another success is to get a player in the first team setup, isn't it? And in that's a way, your, your academy teams have been hampered by the fact that you've had players in the first team setup. But, yeah. you know, that's kind of, <laughs> in a way, it's a, it's just a strange thing, isn't it? Success on one hand, not success on the other. But ultimately, that's what you're there to provide, isn't it? Players who possibly can go on and make the first team. And and, and everything is geared around the first team. And we, we have to appreciate that. And, you know, we, we went to Luton in the semi-final of the floodlit. And we had Stevenage, first team, on the same night. And Jackson's on the bench for the first team. And it's like, what's more important for him? To, to play in a semi-final under real pressure and be like captain and leader or is it to be around the first team and hope that he could get on and all the time you kind of you've got that thing where you are oh, I hope the game swings this way and he can get on for five minutes or ten minutes and I feel really sorry for Jackson because in the end him being around the first team he never actually got on to make his debut yeah. and and this is this is the thing that for us is constant swings and roundabouts Yes, it's a pat on the back that an, an academy boy is in the first team, but you always want them to try and get on the pitch because for the 90 minutes that they've not played in that game, they're becoming deconditioned. Mm. And, and all our boys, we look to, for them to hit a certain amount of total distance per week. As soon as they're not hitting that total distance and they're travelling on coaches and having pre-match meals and post-match meals but not burning it off, it... it it really can affect the boys' mentality because they suddenly can start thinking that they're a first-team player mm. and it can start affecting them from a physical point of view. Great from a social and game understanding, being in stadiums, being around the fans and stuff like that, brilliant. But as, as Swindon fans and as Swindon staff, there's nothing better for us than seeing a player get on the pitch. And, and Harrison for us has, has been brilliant this season. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Jackson was also sub, I think, at Wimbledon, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that experience is there. But it has a downside, as you've just explained. Many of us yeah. might think, well, great. You know, he's on the bench for the first team. Fabulous. Yeah. But as you quite rightly say, any of us who've been a sub at any level at any game, you'd rather be on the pitch playing football, wouldn't you? Yeah, I think, I think the Wimbledon game still kind of sticks with me a little bit because, again, there was no, absolutely no reason why he couldn't have got on the pitch that day. No. And, and, and that's a, it was, yeah, it was a bad one because we drew, I think we drew, I think actually we played Luton that day as well at 18 and we drew 1 1. So for us, we're kind of, we're competing and getting good results against good teams, very good teams. And then you kind of sacrifice a player because you think he's going to get a real good opportunity. And it, it was just disappointing that he didn't get on the pitch because I, I feel the way the game went and unfolded, there's no better opportunity um, to give him five, ten minutes and, and go and show him, you know, go and yeah, I, I, I can't remember how, how the goals went in now. It's a little while ago, but we were comfortably in front. Let's put it like yeah. that. Yeah. And it was a five, one away win. So yeah, ideal opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Bob says a drum behind the dugout winning is not all about being nice. I mean, Lincoln is well, they're well known for their atmosphere. It's an incredible atmosphere on a match yeah. day there. I mean, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, they do use a drum. Many Swindon fans don't like drums, but, they do use the drums a great effect. So what about that then with a young player who gets a chance to be in the squad of the first team, yeah. it doesn't come on. 
is there a coming down? Is there a in their mental attitude? Do you see the point I'm making? Because yeah. you know, all right, it's great to be around the first team squad, but as I said, the whole object of it is to play football. But how do you deal with the young player who doesn't get on and comes back to you? And is there a coming down from it or not? I think I think it's the, it's, it's the biggest one. You know, like a week in football is like it's like dog years, isn't it? You know, for every one year, it's like seven years. So it's like literally every one week in football is like two months of, of normal life the amount of things that are going on and we 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 have multidisciplinary team meetings every month every monday and we obviously we talk about three or four set players from under nine right through to under 18 but then we also talk about anyone who's potentially going to be around the first team so what would happen is when a boy we know is going to go and train with the first team um ben hawkins but now that will obviously be sophie will just be around training, just from a player care point of view, you know, how is he, how does he look? They will kind of feed back. Um, and we just get as many different sets of eyes around the boy because everyone would be like straight away, oh, how did he do? How did he get on? Was he, is he going to be in squad? It's like, just forget about all of that. Don't put any pressure on him. Just relax. Just let it be a normal training session. And for sometimes, boys might train six, ten times and still not get around a match day squad. So it's, it's dealing with that as well, because then the boys might question, well, why am I not around it? You know, and obviously it might only be, there might be a suspension, there might be an injury and an academy boy will get used to fill a slot, you know, and we, and we have to understand that. And we have to put that understanding across to 16, 17, 18 year old boys, which is, it's difficult for them to understand that. Hmm. But the more people we have around them and supporting them with that, um, then the better it is. Obviously, Lee Peacock's been there and done it. So as the 18s, like he might have a little chat. So we'll we would try and pull them at different stages over the week. So it might be the S and C might have a little chat with them in the warm up. Um, it could be like I said, like Sophie from a player care point of view. Um, but everyone would be aware as staff what was happening, mm. so we could support that boy because. Let's be honest, whoever's played football at every any level, the, the dream is, if you're a 15, 16-year-old kid, to get on there and make a mark, isn't it? That's what you want to do. You want to get on there and make a mark. Harrison Minton's made a, a real mark this season, and I think most people agree he has the makings, you know, early, early for him, obviously, but he has the makings. And that's what any young player wants to do, make a mark, don't they? Look at the Gascoigns, look at the Francis, people like that. H how do you... So therefore, you've got to deal with the aftermath where they haven't made a mark. But I suppose the one thing you'd say to them is there's plenty of time to, for development. I guess that's one way of dealing with it, is it? Yeah, I think the, the big thing for us is, is getting around and making sure that when a young player gets an opportunity to play for the first team, that they've got the right amounts of, of support around them in terms of first team players. It, it, it does annoy me when you see first team debuts being given out and it's just literally a team of 18, 19 year olds mm. because that boy will need an, an old head, some experience around him. For me, like a Ben Gladwin or someone like that would be perfect. You know, like a Charlie is now. He's been there, he's seen it, he's done it at different levels. Mm. He can have that little chat with him in the changing room before they go out, chat at half time. You know, and Charlie, Charlie's been brilliant with the young lads um, that have come up this year. And Sometimes the boys put so much pressure on themselves, like you just are there to leave a mark. Just get on the pitch and just make five simple passes. Mm. You know, just and like it's took Harrison. Harrison's had so many, you know, one minute he's been up there, the next minute he's been down there, then he's been out on loan at Chippenham. You know, that resilience that Harrison has built up is unbelievable because it for him, he's probably questioned himself so many times over the last 18 months. But it's making sure people getting around him, having chats with him, making sure he's okay. And I mean, he did excellent away at Leighton Orient. He did very well against, you know, Carlisle. He couldn't have asked for any harder games, really, to mm. come into a League Two. And as a as an eighteen slash nineteen year old centre back, I think you I think you'll struggle to find many more in, in League Two, League One. Because if you're gonna get a debut, it's usually as a number nine, a seven, an eleven or a ten. Like an attacking player, it's it's very rare that you get you'll get a centre back. So Harrison Harrison's done very very well with, with that this season.
Yeah. And Charlie, of course, is <laughs> he knows the downside of it as well, doesn't he? Because, you know, he was at Reading, I think, as yeah. a youngster. Yeah. And he knows, you know, that there is disappointment and you don't immediately make it. But boy, there is a path eventually if you. Yeah, definitely. And I think like Charlie's just on his B licence. So, you know, he he's like, like Ben Gladwin than his. And it's really important that these guys start giving something back. And, you know, I think sometimes we expect, oh, he's a footballer, so he's going to be an unbelievable coach or he's going to be an unbelievable manager. Mm-hmm. They're, they're still, they're learning a new trade now. It's like being a tradesman, being a carpenter and then expecting him to be an unbelievable plumber. It's not mm-hmm. going to happen. It's nice. a completely different skill set that you need. And I feel, I feel with, across the academy, I feel we're getting a real, a real good blend of ex-teachers, footballers, people that have been around development, people that have been around first teams. I spoke with Johnny Goddard this week um, about the possibility of coming in and working with some of our young, younger groups as well. So again, it's another ex-Swindon player coming in and understanding what the club is, understanding what the values are of the academy and what we're going after and, and supporting the boys around that because he can just give that extra little spin on something around an experience that he's had playing for the first thing at Swindon, which, which is priceless. Um, lots of comments coming in now. This is from Brad. Amazing just how much the academy has progressed and players have made it into the first team this season. Great work from all of the academy. And I don't know if it's... The Will Meadow lookalike on my screen, Jamie Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had that before? I don't, I'm not sure there is a resemblance, but anyway, there we are. Uh, <laughs> um, let's have a look. Uh, why was Williams not offered a deal as our top player? That's Johnny Williams. That's nothing to do with you, is it? We can move on yeah. from that. No, nothing to do with you. That's all. Yeah, fair enough. Um, uh, that, and where's the interest in other players? That's not you either. So we'll move that along. Uh, aside from uh, the football, what pastoral care is available for young academy players? We've already touched on this. The the aftercare, you know, when they're not going to be taken on, has come yeah. on a great deal, hasn't it? Uh, but obviously we hear a lot about mental health yeah. these days in lots of different ways. How do you deal with that? Because, you know, most of us just trundle along and people will say, you OK? And we go, yeah, all right. Yeah. Do you have an an inkling when somebody isn't feeling all right? Do, is are you able to to work that out? I think what you've just said there, it's not just young footballers nowadays, is it? No, it's it's people it's, in general, you know. Yeah. Everyone, I think everyone's got something going on um, behind the scenes, and it's very rarely that someone will go, "Actually, do you know what? Yeah, I'm I'm actually struggling, and I, and I need this, or I need I need some help." We we linked in straight away at the start of the season with Go Again. Um, which is a, a mental health consultancy um, company. And we've done lots of work with them around tying in with our values and our psychological like strategy. So they, they've been around, they've done workshops with the young players. And I think it's, it's really important not to kind of go too much with younger boys in the academy, like nines, like to 12. So they will have classroom sessions. So they'll be aware of it, um, but it won't actually hone in and then, from probably 15s upwards, it starts getting a little bit, little bit more in depth around what it looks like. Uh, in terms of pastoral care, we've got um, Kirk McGinn, who looks after the education and safeguarding. So Kirk's very good. We we tie in a lot with the schools and we work a lot with the schools. So obviously, as you can imagine, some of our players aren't uh, angels at school. So we tie in with, with how they learn best at school. Um, and see if we can replicate that. And also, if there's things that we can do at Swindon to help them from how they're behaving at school. Then we have a Forever Red program, which is our transition program. And we've, we've set up now alumni groups. So from the last five seasons of under 18s that have not been offered professional contracts, we've now got them as groups. So one of the plans for this season would be to hold a Forever Red event let's just say before one of the, the league fixtures and have a room where everyone comes back. Because once for me, once you've been at Swindon and you've played at Swindon, you should be forever Swindon. Like you should mm-hmm. always be like that mark has been etched on you. And there's nothing more that we would want is to celebrate that, but also to see how we can still help them with what they're doing in life. So if they are 
they've got a keen interest in analysis or medical or anything like that is there a route that they could come back into the academy but through a different field so we've just recently had um our professional contract decisions which again are really really difficult and loads of conversations around it again sometimes it comes down to depth charts it comes down to different things like that we've we've got two boys that hopefully will be going out to america on, on scholarships and they've both been granted scholarships as well which which is a, is a massive thing so um one for division one and one for division two mm. now that is a route now into major league soccer and major league soccer at the moment still doesn't kind of know what it is whether it's european or whether it's american so every other sport in america will have a draft system mm. the mls is kind of flirting with it a little bit as to whether it's going to go that way or whether it's going to go the english route but for our boys to get a scholarship in america which will be four years they can transfer at any point to a higher university which can give them a better opportunity to they can transfer their education across so the, the most important thing for us is they're still in education they're still developing and they're still playing football yeah it's interesting we we, we had um um I, oh gosh um jan arga fjortov son marcus fjortov on on monday and he played in college football in america yeah college soccer i better say just to differentiate and he was into the draft system for Seattle Sounders yeah. and the New York Red Bulls, and he was explaining about it. I mean, it is a slightly different system, isn't it? I mean, baseball has it, American football has it, ice hockey has it in America. So for them to go out and get experience, uh, presumably uh, when you say Division One and Division Two, that means colleges, does it? Yeah, the college yeah. system. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, a great experience, isn't it? Because the, the, yeah. they, you know, they they really do look after them. They give them a scholarship. Education is very important, of course, yeah. um, as you've been talking about, really. So to tie two together, that's a fantastic experience for young players to have. Definitely, and and the incentive for the boys is the better that they're doing over there. So if they get into the first team, and then they become like a starter in the first team, and then people start noticing them from other clubs, they can they can end up getting like a hundred percent scholarship which you can imagine a scholarship in America for education is forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 quite easily. So at the moment, I think, I think our boys have like got 60 or 70% paid for. So we, we've supported them with like their show reels, their clips from when they played for Swindon. Kirk's helped them, sat down, wrote personal statements, different things like that. So, you know, we've chased as well for them. So, you know, we've been onto the American agents and, you know, when they've been messing our boys around and just, just kind of like, just keeping the momentum and keep pushing it along because you know the big thing that i tell our boys is that okay yeah you've been released from swindon don't just think you've got this or tell me to walk into another club or to walk in because as much as you've just been released boys from blackpool from wigan from chelsea have also been released so you you are competing again now so as you were competing to get a scholarship at 16 with a small pool of players you're now competing to get you know whether a university place you know another club through the exit trials or something like that you have to make sure you are looking after yourself and you are working quickly to, to get yourself secured um because like i said everyone's after your place yeah extraordinary competition um how much attention do managers pay to the academy is one question i.e jody morris now you mentioned about styles. Of course, we're about to have a new manager in terms of Mar uh, Michael Flynn. Um, I, I don't know if you've had meetings with him. I assume you, you've spoken to him. Uh, I mean, it's a weird time of the year, isn't it, where people are on holiday, all that kind of thing. Uh, have you had much discussion with Michael Flynn about where he wants to go, how he wants to play, all that kind of thing, how you fit in with all that? Yeah, so we've uh, not had too much conversation at the moment. Uh, I think mainly that's just because of the time of year, really. Mm. Um he's got to make sure that you know he's got his people sorted that he wants as a club we need to make sure that we're sorted with, with where we're going and what we're doing um and then i think it's always it's always the best place then to have those conversations i think when there's a little bit of uncertainty or anything like that it, it doesn't really lead to confident communication and i feel with with when you with the manager of of worked around so many different first team managers mm. and all of them are completely different and you can't really second guess any of them so you know some people might go oh my god he's, he's like this he does this he does this and you've got this image in your head 
and then they come through the door and they're absolutely completely different. So you just have to, I just, we, you just have to take people on face value. Yeah. But we, 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 we will have a good, oh, that was my watch. Um, <laughs> but we will have a good, um, a good relationship. And, and I think the thing is, there's so many people that cross over, like I've mentioned, Charlie, Lee Peacock's around. Obviously, there's, there's other staff, Mildy as well, who, you know, instrumental in being our, he's like our dedicated transitional coach. Um, so he, they look after the younger players if it's like an away trip or anything like that. So building those relationships won't be a problem. Excellent. Uh, I don't know how much of a relationship you got with Jody Morris. He just sort of wasn't here very long. Yeah. Um, I think we've, we had, uh, obviously, Scott Lindsay at the start. Then there was uh, Gavin, Steve, and then there was Jody Morris, and now there's Michael Flynn. I mean, that is I, – I, you've got on this list of things that you wanted to talk about tonight, relationships. My goodness, trying to form a relationship with anybody in football these days is so transitory, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, not to Swindon, but anywhere. You look at any club. I think, I think relationships uh, in, internally and externally are huge. And I think the thing that we've done really well as an academy this year is build relationships outside. We've built them inside the club, but we've we've gone out and purposely built relationships outside of the club. And that's that's been the biggest thing. So for us, you know, Melksham, Highworth, Corsham, uh, Supermarine and stuff like that, they're our immediate. But then we've, you know, we've been up to Wantage, we talk about these boys bridging the gap between 18s and first team. We have to get boys loan experience mm. to go and really kind of get some football minutes at men's football on their on their CV. We we do that with these guys, but but from that as well, you know, we get the use of their pitch. You know, Caution was and, and Melksham have been brilliant for us this season around that. You know, sometimes it's been a last minute phone call because someone's let us down, and and these guys are only too happy to to help us. So. You know, relationships have been key with us as well for training facilities. So myself and Alex went up to um, the Agricultural University um, last Thursday because we're, we're, we're trying to just find a place where we can actually have a base um, on, a, on a Sunday morning for games and different things like that. And, you know, Stratton play up there at the moment and we're, we're doing some work and hopefully having some real good conversations there. And, we will do as much as we can to support clubs within the area. You know, we will come and do presentations. We'll come and do coaching sessions. People can come and watch and be around. We we don't want people to think that it's kind of we think we're better than everyone else, and it's almost like elitism and there's a wall up with everything that we do. I would think we're very very open and transparent with what we do um, because we want we want the supporters to understand what we're what we're trying to do for the club in, in producing and developing players that will hopefully play for the first team in years to come. Yeah. Um, is that the agricultural, uh, is that Siren or lack yeah. of Siren? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, don't, it is from Steve. Don't know how you manage to keep the players' heads up when the first team is full of youngsters from other academies and are given a chance ahead of our own home ground talent. That's quite an interesting question, isn't it? Because Sweden have had a policy of signing... Uh, players from like the likes of Liverpool, people like that. Um, yeah, how difficult is that? Because there might be some in the academy who might think, well, I deserve a chance, you know, rather than this kid who's coming from Liverpool or something. I, I, that's a difficult one to deal with, I guess, in a way, is it? Yeah, definitely. Um, all, all we do is we look to, to free pathways up. But when people come in and block a pathway, Hmm. and there's not been communication around it, then it, it can be quite disappointing for us. But it, the most important thing is, is for us is that we don't show that to the players. I think from a, from a management and leadership point of view of me, I think it's, it's very important to moan up, but not moan down. Because if everyone underneath is, is feeling a little bit pissed off and you know hurt and angry, then that's just going to spread like wildfire. So it's yeah. very important that we kind of, you know, keep working hard, you're doing nothing wrong, keep doing this... You'll get you'll get that opportunity, and all we can do then is take every possible chance we can just to big them up as players, celebrate their success, get it on Twitter, which I feel like we've done better this season, mm. uh, and you know we've made a real conscious push of that to try and get more information out, um, and something that obviously we'll, we'll we'll continue with next year. But yeah, it is frustrating. I can't sit here and say it's not frustrating because it is frustrating because that's what we are about: developing players and we want them to play in the first team. 
and for me, like we've fought Harrison's corner on numerous occasions. Um, and then he comes out and then you get people going, oh, he's doing well today. Like really shocked. It's like, well, you, obviously you don't know him then or you haven't you haven't seen him. Like we, we've seen him like take what we're saying as, you know, the right thing. We're not just trying to push a player because he's an academy player. We're trying to push a player because we feel that they will, they will represent the academy, but represent the club well. And that's what Harrison has done. Yeah, if you, I mean, if I was to say to you, you develop a player and then that player goes for a few million, say, is that success? Is that, um, if you think of Ollie Watkins, for instance, you know, came through the extra academy, ends up playing for Villa, plays for England, yeah. ends up playing for their training ground, effectively. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, is that success? Is there a hint of frustration or are you delighted that that, would, that situation would occur? Yeah, great question again. Uh, it is success. And, and again, but it's it's making sure that everyone sees that as a success because I think it's very easy to go, ah, oh, here we go, we've lost another player. Why aren't they staying? But sometimes, if it means we get a training ground, if it means we can trade something off and, and get, you know, support the club with something and also a chunk of that money comes back into the academy for extra staff, for better facilities, for to maybe support going as category two, which is something that, you know, myself and Clem have had numerous conversations around. Um, then sometimes you have to kind of look at the bigger picture and go, actually, for the sake of selling one player, we can actually get all of this. But we don't want to be seen as a selling club and we don't want to be seen as a selling academy. We're not producing players for other people. Yeah, fair enough. That's a very good point. Um, right. Um, there was a, a, one thing that I, I was surprised to learn when we spoke originally, and that's your kind of, your Ofsted. I mean, you are, <laughs> if, if I might use that word, um, you do have audits, don't you? And they're very, they're very strict audits, but the last one was very good for you. So just explain that audit process. Too many audits, if I'm going to be honest. Literally, I feel like I've become the audit king this year. Um, we have had, um, so we are part of the EPPP. So we get funding for having a category. So we are category three status, which means we the, the club puts in X amount of money. And for that, we receive a payment from the, from the league. For us to go category two, it's around a 750,000 payment. So it's a big, it's a big step up. So this is, is, is that uh, is that seven hundred and fifty grand that the club puts in, or all the Premier League puts in? Both, both, right? So, okay. so you, you've got a total budget then at category two of working with around one point five, right? So that that next step is a, is a big step for us, but we have to make sure that the foundations are correct and that everything we're doing is right, and, and we're very secure. And from an from the audit from an audit point of view, I sound like one of the auditors there because that's what they all say. But from an audit point of view, they come round, they will mark you. So we have a safe to operate, which means our all coaching staff, our all academy staff, our all club staff that are around the boys at any point in time have a DBS. Is that DBS, you know, in date? Um, because you hear horror stories from other clubs. Yeah, sure. What's DBS? Just to uh, tell us what that is. So basically, it's, it's like the old school CRB. Yeah, what's it stand for, DBS? Yeah. Do we, do we very good, very good question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to think to ask that on the audit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of horror stories at other clubs where you've got senior senior members of staff and they've, they've got no, no criminal record check or anything like that. And... And they're just left, you know, for us, let's say a 16 year old or a 17 year old goes with the first team. We can't share a room. So there's, there's lots of things from around an audit that we have to, to make sure that, you know, he, he can't, he can't get changed in the same changing room as the first team players. He has to have his own changing space. So there's lots of things just around, you know, if a young player goes with the first team. So from an audit, you will get checked on that as well. Um, You'll get checked on coach ratios, where you coach. Um, what else do we get pulled up on? Safe, um, safer recruitment has been a big thing this year. 
um, with them from how you recruit people to come in and work for the academy. Um, but for us, it, it, it couldn't have gone any better, really. Um, we had four small action points from that audit, and they've all been they've all been passed now. So the academy wasn't far off, really. Um, bottom of the pile, if I'm going to be honest, when, when, when we came in, um, like special measures a little bit. Um, so because of that, we had the best practice audit, uh, sorry, safe to operate audit. We've had a Bernardo's audit, which is all around safeguarding. Um, and as you can imagine, very intense, two women coming in from Bernardo's, clipboards, sitting down, interviews with players, interviews with parents, interviews with staff, interviews with host families, going through all of the policies, um, separate interviews with um, with senior staff, um, very intense. But again, we've, we've come out with satisfactory and close to good, which again, we were not, not achieving um, to a high level at all in 2019 when the last um, Bernardo's audit was done. And then as a club, we've had a health and safety audit, um, which again involves the academy because the boys get changed in the county ground. They have food in the county ground and they do their education in the county ground. So again, the academy was involved in that. So yeah, a lot of audits, um, but it does make everyone tighten up on what they're doing. And I feel as, as a club, not only club staff, you know, we've looked at ourselves a lot this year with, with what's been getting what's been done um and i think the club is going in the right direction um with, with all the work that's been done behind the scenes um hello to caroline well, i think you might know caroline uh, disclosure and barring service she says there you go, there you go. thank you so Caroline. she's happy to help out she says. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are um mark says scott twine was a perfect example of youth transition to playing squad that our club had no clue about because People will look at Scott Twine and say, now he's a Premier League player. Yeah. And he didn't really get a chance at Swindon. <laughs> Can you explain maybe why that happens? Sometimes a club misses out on playing a player who's gone on to greater things. Yeah. I think sometimes if, if a, I've seen it quite a few times with boys that have been in a system or a club for maybe eight years. And I think sometimes they're still looked at as an under 12 or an under 13 and they think, oh, maybe he's not got the capability to do that. Or you've got, the, in a Scott Twine situation, I don't know who was the centre forwards at that time of Swindon, but whether they were, you know, big, strong centre forwards, whether the system didn't fit him. Um, but ironically, it was Michael Flynn that gave him his chance. At, yeah, exactly. Well, Steve has uh, made that very point. Yeah. 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 And, and, and that's the thing now, you know, that's, you look at that and you go, that's fantastic. But then you can't expect Michael Flynn to give every young player a chance. And and, and this is what I'm talking about. It's like it's happened once and, and hopefully, you know, we, we will do it again. Obviously, from that happening, we understand that, you know, Michael will play younger players, which is, which is fantastic for us. But I think sometimes they just see something in a player um, that can that can give, some, give them something that they haven't got currently. And I imagine like at the time of a Newport, you're not blessed with a massive transfer budget. So if you can get a boy that maybe is on a free a free loan or a minimal amount of money, then really you've got nothing you've got nothing to lose, have you? So yeah, I think he got eight goals for Newport, if I remember rightly, on yeah. his own. Yeah. So um, yeah, um, Twine was destroying every game at Newport, and we let him go. Well, he's gone on to greater things, and we wish him well. Clearly, yeah. uh, you know, he's in the Premier League with Burnley. So I think was, he. He's someone like we've got one of these signed shirts, a Burnley signed shirt in the academy, and that's something that we really want to push with with younger players. As, as use, it, use it to our power now with recruitment and go. You know, Scott Twine came through the system. Look where he is. Mm, yeah. So if we're, if we're battling it out with a Bristol Rovers or a Bristol City or a Cheltenham to get a player, there's there's names now that we can obviously the Thompsons as well. There's there's names that we can drop in that have gone on to play. You know, Championship, League One, Premier League now in terms of Scott's case. Uh, and it just helps us. You know, we, we have got players that have played at those levels. Where, where do you want to go? Because I I, I get, and, I, and every time I've spoken to you, I get your passion for this job. You love it, don't you? And 
you know, developing young players and, and helping them along, and not only as footballers, but humans. I, I get your passion for that. I, I, is, is this where you are in, in your head? Are you looking to go elsewhere? Where, where are you looking for in the future? I think for me, I, I just, I think we're in a real good position and we have a real good opportunity now to, to create, we've talked about like golden threads throughout the club. So a football in golden thread from an under nine right through to a first team. But having consistency that, that's running through that, it's not a case of this is academy and this is first team. Just having that consistency in everyone. We have the consistency that we can go after with player care now and we can run that through the club. Um, hopefully we're going to have an appointment where someone's going to be coming into the club around like first team level, but we'll work alongside um, the player care work that's been happening. Um, in the academy because that's really really important and people don't understand how important that is first team players need exactly the same amount of support as mm. academy players because they don't want to go out and make mistakes they don't want to get things wrong they don't want to let people down and there's going to be times when they're going to do that and they're going to start questioning themselves that can lead to other things that can, you know they can get pulled in different directions and sometimes they just need someone who's not a decision maker to talk to and, ju and just get some support from and I think you know sometimes we put footballers on this pedestal that they're untouchable and you know they, they just go out week after week and perform and January transfer window is a prime example where you've got people that literally could be living one end of the country and the, the next day could be moving somewhere else they might be leaving their family behind they might be leaving friends behind and they're just expected just to turn up oh we did that for that club so he's going to do that for us it's like it's very, very, you know, there's a lot of pressures put onto players, but I, I really do feel if we get this MDT approach right across the club, we can, we can really make some big differences. And, uh, you know, it would be great to go and have a huge budget and go and say, yeah, we want these players and that players. I think there's, I think there's more we could do as a, a collective group of staff um, to make some serious changes. Meetings. Uh, I know you have a lot of those. Um, I mean, are they the lifeblood of the academy to make sure everybody's in the same, you know, going in the same direction? How important are meetings? I mean, the profession I used to be in, in the radio business, my goodness, we'd have a meeting about a meeting. I mean, I, I assume you kind of, you know, there are reasons for the for them, but how important are they? I just think communication is, is the most important thing. And especially across the football club, where you've got so many different departments and, and disciplines and it's it's just amazing how many things overlap but it's also amazing how many times sometimes that someone's not aware of something that actually affects their department quite in a big way um so yeah we do have a lot of meetings we have operations meetings every monday um where the whole week is planned out because for us from 9 to 18 we're in so many different places we don't we're not blessed with a, a huge amount of full-time staff so we have to make sure the part-time staff know where they're going. Can they get there? Medical staff is a big one as well. And for us, you know, I, I talked about the agricultural um, university. If we can actually play our games on the same site on a Sunday, that's a massive, massive thing for us. It doesn't seem like a huge thing, but from a medical point of view, then we can have a smaller pool of medical staff because we know they're at one facility. Whereas at the moment, some Sundays we can be playing across three facilities and now we get to the situation where your Bournemouths and stuff like that won't play. They won't come and play us because they don't have the staff or they don't have the manpower to go to two different facilities or three different facilities and they wouldn't allow our medical department to look after their players if they got injured. It's an, extra cool. an extraordinary amount of organisation and... and I mean, are you going to have a holiday or are you just constantly working out to the start of the season? Are you going to have a break or not? Yeah, a few, a few days next week. Um, but like I said, literally now, is it, it, everyone thinks as soon as the football season, that last that last, you know, last know, whistle's been blown at, at the county ground, that's it, everyone's done. There's probably so much, there's probably even more work that goes on now across the club. And that's across all the club staff, all of the departments, just making sure that everything is ready for next season you know because everyone wants to hit the ground running myself and alex you know have been putting putting some stuff together he's still on the phone to staff continually the staff came in and did their departmental presentations 
of like their review of the season for, for what they've done and how what they've achieved. Yeah, I, I, I it just I think to be honest though, once you're in football, it's like a hamster wheel, and you're just used to constantly, constantly being on it. And when you're not on it, you, you miss it. You miss it mm. massively. Amazing stuff that goes on. I mean, the reaching out to the community as well is now, I mean, I know the Community Foundation do an incredible amount of work, but that's another thing in football, isn't it, that over the years has developed enormously because the community is the lifeblood of the football club in a way, isn't it, in terms of you need to connect with that community out there. It's a big part of a football club. Yeah, it's huge. I think like doing things like this, um, having open trial days, Opportunities to go and coach at grassroots clubs. We've we've done some recruitment evenings where we've invited um, coaches in or you know chairmen from different grassroots clubs to come in and just listen to how we recruit and, and why we do what we do. Because if I'm say Supermarines under twelves and I've got a really really good centre forward, it's really difficult for Supermarine because we one hat we want that player. But then if I'm Supermarines under 12s manager, I want to keep hold of that player because he's winning me games. And, it, and that's helping him attract players to his group. So we have to get that balance right. And we can't we can't go out there thinking that every club's just going to get on the phone to us and go, all oh, right, this is this player. So we, we've, done, we've had a lot of success um, from open trial days this year. And I mean, some uh, the, one, the one time it was literally, I think we had it open for two days. <clears throat> we had over 60 apply for a trial and it's for us we just had to close it straight away and and think i think some of the staff at, at times don't realize how big the club is across wiltshire mm. and i think for me doing the whole kind of tour around wiltshire trying to find facilities and locations and building relationships and stuff like that like everywhere you go there is a big like swindon following and everyone is as passionate about the club and everyone wants the club to go in the right direction and would do everything they can to support us and i think this is where from a club's point of view i might be talking i might be talking wrong but it's how i found it i don't think there's been enough of that in the in the past i don't think there's been enough of people from the club going out and reaching to the community and reaching to support other clubs like we've we've done more um pre-season friendlies with local clubs and i know that there's a couple that are probably upset that they haven't got a pre-season friendly um but then next year we can look to extend that because that's that's what we want to do and we want to look after and we want to support those local clubs because at some point we will need their support so it's only fair that we support them in, in the first place question from ray how'd you get on with clem i mean it's difficult isn't it because he's in australia <laughs> i mean do you have a lot to do with him or not is he yeah, he's yeah. passionate about the academy i know he is because he's, uh, he's passionate about the club yeah like he's I think that I think the difficult thing with Clem is obviously when he's when he's away. So a lot of the time for me and him, it's and either the the stuff that he speaks with, it's either late night calls. So if, if it's like early for him, it's late for us. So then you're you might be really tired, or it's vice versa. So I spoke with Clem today, and I know how late it was at night for him. Mm. So like I'm I'm trying to make everything as short and as precise as I can, and not get into a long conversation because I know it's probably like one o'clock in the morning for him, and he needs to get he needs to get to bed, but. Yeah, constant, constant dialogue, constant communication around what we want to do, where we want to go, how we want to do it, and you know, and he, and he does support that. Well, all power to your elbow, Jamie. I think you do a fantastic job, and I don't know. You, I mean, are, there are. I've said to this to you before, but are there forty-eight hours in your day? Have you got a different time frame for everybody else? Because it seems to me that you must have. I don't know. How do you do it? How do you fit it all in? Feels like it sometimes. Um, I just think like when you've got good staff and you've got good people around you, it's it's a lot easier to to delegate. And I know like Caroline said that about what DBS is and different things like that. But that's I think I feel that's just how the, the staff are. There's a real, real good nucleus of staff that jump in and help each other, and they all want the club to do well. And I think when you've got that support around you, it's it, it is a, a lot easier to cram a lot of things into one day. Well, I wish you well. Thank you ever so much for joining us this evening. I hope we do get a few days break. Because, no um, <laughs> uh, you know, the work you do is invaluable. So thank you ever so much. And yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we appreciate it, Chris, don't we? We certainly do. Yes, uh, yeah. it's fascinating just listening to sort of everything's coming on. So it's, um, 
yeah, no, absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much, Jamie. No, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. So um, that's all. No problem at all. You're welcome anytime. So that's all for tonight. Um, one thing to say, which I forgot at the beginning, uh, you might have seen on socials that we launched a um, century book, uh, Susie and Sammy Go to Swindon Town. It is now available in the shop and um, on the web as well, so um, on the store. So please have a look at that if you've got any children that are due to go to the crate ground for the first time or just give them a bit of uh, um, confidence to go. It's a brilliant book, absolutely brilliant. So please have a look at that. Okay, so we will be back on Monday uh, with Brian Howard um, coming on and well, enjoy the sunshine and we will see you all next week. Bye. Where do I go? See, Jamie, they don't want you to go. Not allow me to switch off. <laughs> <laughs> We're still live on Channel 4. Not on Channel 4, obviously, clearly, but uh, <laughs> it's still live, I think. It's live. It won't, it won't let me switch off. Yeah, no, we won't let you switch off. <laughs> See, they've enjoyed it so much. The system says you're not going anywhere. <laughs>